His spine cracked as the serrated electro whip flayed the flesh from his back. Tyler Phillips fell to his knees, biting down a scream, refusing to give his Prylorian tormentor the satisfaction. He glared up at Vortis, the sadistic alien slave master, with eyes that promised murder. Around them, hundreds of human slaves toiled in the choking pollution of the factory planet. Furnaces belched black smoke that stung the eyes and coated the lungs. Ore grinders shrieked and clanged. Booted feet splashed through puddles of chemical sludge. Prylorian guards prowled with weapons ready, eager for any excuse to inflict pain. Ten years ago, when Tyler had been a teenager focused on sports and video games, the Prylorians invaded Earth. Humanity's defences crumpled against the alien empire's crushing technological superiority. Prylorian ships smashed human fleets, shrugged off nuclear missiles, and bombarded cities to rubble. Armies of gene-engineered Prylorian soupy soldiers marched through the ruins, gunning down survivors and capturing millions as slaves. They stripped Earth of resources and moved on to their next conquest, as they had with dozens of species before. Since then, Tyler had watched helplessly as his fellow humans suffered and died under the Prylorians' brutality. The aliens viewed their slaves as disposable, replaceable tools to be used up. They beat and tortured humans for the slightest infractions, or for mere amusement. They pitted slaves against each other for scraps of food and trinkets of privilege. Thousands perished from exhaustion, starvation, sickness, and despair. But not Tyler. He endured it all. And he planned. Hidden in secret spaces throughout the slave quarters, Tyler and a dedicated cadre of rebels cached weapons, stolen from Prylorian guards. They smuggled bits of explosives out of the munitions factories. They scavenged parts to build communicators and tapped into the aliens' networks. They identified the guards most vulnerable to ambush, the power systems that could be sabotaged, the landing pads where Prylorian ships touched down. For years they prepared, waiting for the right moment to ignite a planet-wide uprising and slaughter their oppressors. Now as the Electro Whip split his back again, and agony crackled along his nerves, Tyler decided that the moment had come. Today, the Prylorian Galactic Empire would learn the true cost of enslaving the human race. Today, the Prylorians on this bleak factory world would pay for their crimes in blood and fire. Today, Earth would show these aliens the meaning of hell. Two days had dragged by since the whipping. Tyler's back still burned from the electro whiplashes as he worked in the control room, but he ignored the pain. He had a mission. Bent over a gutted control panel, he pretended to clean corrosion from the circuit boards. His rag polished a shiny data port. With a surreptitious motion, he slid a tiny chip from his sleeve into the port. The chip held a vicious computer virus, a malicious masterpiece coded by the Resistance's best hackers. If it reached the central computers, it would cripple the Prylorian systems across the planet. Tyler glanced around. The other slaves were focused on repairs and the guards seemed bored. His fingers danced over the keypad masked by his body. He uploaded the virus and typed in the command to transmit it through the networks. The progress bar crept forward. 90%, 95%. The door hissed open. Tyler lunged to block the console, but he was too slow. Vortis strode in with a phalanx of guards and spotted the unauthorized chip. The alien's eyes narrowed to furious slits. What treachery is this, slave? Vortis snarled. His fist smashed into Tyler's face in a vicious backhand. Blood sprayed from a split lip. The guard seized Tyler before he could finish the upload. He kicked and struggled, but their grip was unbreakable. They hauled him out of the control room to the detention block. In a cell, they shackled Tyler to the wall. Vortis circled him, glaring with disgust. Did you really think you could outsmart us? We are your masters now and forever. Tyler spat a glob of blood on the floor. Humanity will never submit. We'll fight to our last breath. Vortis punched him in the stomach. Tyler doubled over, wheezing. The Prylorian grabbed his hair and wrenched his head up. Who helped you plant that virus? Give me names and I may grant you a quick death. Tyler grinned through crimson-stained teeth. Fuck you! Vortis' eyes smoldered with rage. 
he pummeled Tyler until the human hung limp in the restraints on the edge of consciousness. Your pathetic resistance is futile, watch. Vortis tapped a control panel, and a hollow screen flickered on. It showed Prylorian engineers gathered around the console where Tyler had inserted the chip. They pried it out and ran programs to eradicate the virus. The Prylorian Empire is eternal, Vortis gloated. Your species is weak. You exist only to serve us. I will enjoy watching you break, as all slaves do. Despair crushed down on Tyler like a collapsing star. The virus had been the Resistance's trump card, the product of months of meticulous, risky labor. With it, they could have crippled the alien's rule and inspired a planet-wide revolt. Now that dream collapsed into ashes. Vortis turned to leave, laughing cruelly. Get comfortable, slave. You will be spending a long time in here. But don't worry, I'll visit often. The door slid shut with a final thud. Tyler slumped in his shackles, bloody and beaten, but as he lifted his head a faint smile touched his split lips. The virus had only been a distraction. The data chip's true purpose was to broadcast a hidden signal to the resistance cells, a message embedded in a scrap of code. Stage one complete, commence stage two. In resistance hideouts scattered across the planet, encrypted communicators buzzed with an urgent message. Stage one complete. Commence stage two. Upon decoding Tyler's signal, rebel leaders sprang into action. They consulted tactical plans meticulously prepared, using insider intelligence. Strike teams armed themselves and mobilized, each one targeting a critical Prylorian facility. At a sprawling armory, human insurgents crept through the shadows. They silently slit the throats of perimeter guards and cracked the lock on a side door. Once inside, they swiftly gunned down the alien soldiers, aiming for gaps in their exoskeletons. Pulse rifles, fragmentation grenades and power armor were hauled out by the crate. Similar scenes unfolded at a hover tank depot. Rebels ambushed the sentries and stormed the motor pool. They hijacked the tanks, blasting their way out through the walls. Confused Prylorian pursuit craft that screamed in behind them suddenly careened into each other as their navigation failed. The humans vanished into the wastelands, grinning. Back in the factory cell block, Tyler heard booted feet marching his way. The door slid open and a squad of guards entered, shock prods crackling. On your feet, slave, one barked. Overseer Vortis wants you. Tyler struggled upright, chains clanking, head down. A guard unlocked his shackles. In that instant, he attacked. His elbow smashed the Prylorian's throat, and his hands seized his weapon. Finger on the trigger, Tyler dove left and fired. The guards dropped, skulls smoking and sizzling. Days ago, Vortis's beating had left Tyler half dead, but a resistance doctor, laboring in hidden tunnels under the factory, had treated his wounds. Broken bones were re-knit, torn flesh regenerated. Tyler was ready for war. He grabbed guns and key cards off the bodies, then he sprinted out and blasted the locks off nearby cells. Dozens of slaves stumbled out, blinking. But these were no ordinary slaves. They were soldiers, captured in the invasion of Earth, trained in combat and survival. Tyler's brothers and sisters in arms. We're taking this factory, Tyler told them, tossing them weapons from the guards. Front assault, cell block B, go. The rebels stormed through the corridors. They cut down Prylorian guards and smashed surveillance cameras. An alarm began to wail. In the control room, a human hacker crouched over the computers, fingers flying as he seized control of the factory defenses. Prylorian reinforcements charged across the assembly floor and ran straight into the guns of their own auto turrets and security drones. Shredded into bloody confetti under a hail of fire, the aliens screamed and died in droves. Not a single one reached the control room. Tyler and his force raced through the factory, shouting and shooting into the air. They called on the slaves to rise up, to seize their freedom. Many did, snatching up tools and debris as weapons, hungry for vengeance. Even those who hesitated were swept up in the surging tide of revolution. At key equipment, human saboteurs planted explosives. Ore crushers, sorting belts and smelting furnaces 
erupted into flames as the charges detonated, the factory ground to a halt, production lines crumbling. Vortis rallied the last of his guards for a desperate final charge, but they were swarmed under by a human wave, thousands strong, armed with Prylorian weapons. The evil slave master fell with a dozen holes in his chest, choking on blood, eyes wide in disbelief. Tyler stood over him, savouring the sight. Humanity will never submit, he told Vortis. Then he put a plasma bolt through the alien's head. In the control room, Tyler patched into the planet-wide broadcast channels. His words rang out to every slave, human and alien across the factory world. This is Tyler Phillips of the Human Resistance. The Keplik Fort Factory is ours. We have overthrown the Prylorians. I call on every slave to rise up, in every mine, every factory, every city. Today we are free. Death to the Prylorians. All through the factory, humans cheered and roared in triumph. A nightmare of oppression and torment was ending. The same scene was repeated in a hundred other locations worldwide, as resistance cells launched attacks with captured Prylorian equipment. Guard barracks were bombed, PDF bases overrun by mobs, supply routes severed. The Prylorian grip on the planet had been smashed like a pane of glass. For the first time in ten years, the aliens were on the defensive, stunned and reeling. Fires of rebellion spread like a dawn. The human uprising had begun at last. On the bridge of his dreadnought, Commander Zoldak watched the video feeds from the planet's surface. His lips curled in disgust at the sight of Prylorian soldiers being overrun by hordes of human slaves. Barracks burned and supply depots exploded as the rebels advanced. Armed with weapons they should never have possessed. Inexcusable, Zoldak growled. How could the local forces allow this to happen? But even as revulsion filled him, a trickle of grudging respect wormed into his mind. The humans moved with coordination and purpose, not like some mindless rabble. They seized strategic targets and consolidated their gains. Zoldak's eyes narrowed as he pieced it together. The power grid failures, the communications blackouts, the vanishing shipments, it was sabotage on a massive scale. The humans had been planning this for Emperor knew how long. They must have infiltrated every level of the Prylorian administration, suborning systems and personnel. This rebellion will be crushed, Zoldak vowed. I've broken species far stronger than these pests. He turned to his waiting officers. Commence orbital bombardment of all rebel concentrations and get the mechanized divisions planetside immediately. We will scour this human filth from the face of the world. Acknowledgements came crisply as the crew rushed to obey. The dreadnought shuddered as its mighty plasma cannons unleashed their wrath. On the surface, the factories where the humans had made their stand vanished in blossoms of white fire. Prylorian drop pods rained down, disgorging heavily armed troopers and hulking armoured vehicles. They surged towards the rebel lines, energy weapons blazing. Tanks with neutron cannons blew smoking holes in the humans' improvised barricades. In the remains of the Keplik Four factory, Tyler Phillips crouched behind a shattered conveyor belt as explosions rocked the debris around him. A Prolorian plasma cannon, ripped from some dead trooper's hands, rested on his shoulder. He sighted down the barrel and loosed a searing blue bolt that vaporized an alien skull. Fall back, Tyler shouted over the din of battle. We've got to buy time for the transports. All across the planet, rebel units were disengaging, giving ground in fighting retreats. Thousands of freed slaves were fleeing to secret bases hidden deep in the untamed wilderness prepared for this day. They had food, medicine, weapons, everything needed to carry on the fight. But they had to get there first. Tyler and his comrades formed a desperate rearguard, struggling to hold back the Prylorian onslaught. Soldiers he'd known for years fell screaming as plasma bursts melted flesh from bone. Reactor team now. Tyler roared into his calm. In the bowels of the factory, a dozen humans heaved a makeshift detonator into place next to the building's fusion core. Wired with scavenged explosives, it had been turned into a city-leveling bomb. The humans fell back, bloody step by bloody step. 
the Prylorians sensed victory and pressed forward. Armored troopers and clanking combat droids marched over the human dead, eyes blazing with triumph. Tyler and the last few survivors reached their fallback point. Blow it, he screamed. The humans who'd volunteered for this duty looked at each other. They clasped hands, teeth gritted in final defiance. Then they flipped the switch. A sun bloomed in the factory's heart. The fusion core ruptured, and the blast ripped the facility apart. A mushroom cloud climbed into the sky as a wall of light and heat consumed the Prylorian forces. Regiments vanished instantly, tanks crumpled like foil, the very ground buckled and burned. Miles away, Zoldak saw the nuclear fireball swell over the horizon. Reports flooded in, the factory destroyed, thousands of Prylorian troops annihilated in the blink of an eye. All across the planet, the story repeated as the rebels sacrificed their strongholds to inflict maximum damage. Shall we pursue the humans into the wilderness, Commander? One officer asked. Saturation orbital bombardment would... No, Zoldak snapped. I will not reduce this planet to an irradiated graveyard. It is still a valuable resource. He glared at the displays showing the humans' last known positions. These slaves wish to fight like vermin, so we shall treat them as such. Deploy the hunter-killer drones, establish forward bases to cut off their supply lines, and get the heavy combat units with anti-guerrilla packages ready for extended operations. Zoldak's eyes glittered coldly. One by one we will dig these creatures out of their holes and make them pay for this insolence. They think they have escaped the Prylorian fist, but all they have done is prolong their agony. The war had become a slog, a brutal back-and-forth grind that seemed to have no end. For months the human rebels waged a relentless guerrilla campaign from their hidden sanctuaries in the untamed wilds. They laid ambushes along Prylorian supply routes, the sharp cracks of projectile rifles and the sizzling hiss of plasma bolts, shattering the eerie stillness. Fuel depots and ammunition dumps erupted into flames under the charges of saboteurs, thick plumes of black smoke rising into the sky. The humans even managed to down the occasional patrol craft with salvaged surface-to-air missiles. There was nothing quite as satisfying as watching a Prylorian shuttle take a rocket to the engine and pinwheel down in a streak of fire. Scratch one more vulture! Tyler's soldiers would whoop over the comms. But for every blow the rebels struck, the Prylorians lashed back twice as hard. Commander Zoldak was as cunning as he was ruthless, anticipating many of the humans' moves. His hunter-killer drones prowled the skies on whisper-quiet thrusters, thermal optics picking out rebel heat signatures through dense foliage. Prylorian forces would swoop down on the humans' camps, pulse rifles hammering, incinerating the flimsy prefab shelters. Chemical shells rained down, disgorging clouds of choking green gas that sent humans stumbling from their bunkers, eyes streaming and lungs searing. Orbital bombardment pounded hilltop outposts and mountain caves into rubble and dust. Forests and valleys that once teemed with life were reduced to blasted wastelands, rebel bodies strewn among the ashes. Tyler and the other resistance leaders were forced to constantly adapt, varying their tactics and striking then fading away before the Prylorians could pin them down. It was a deadly contest of wits and will, the rebels always seeking to stay one step ahead of Zoldak's reprisals. But the grinding attrition was taking a steep toll. The Prylorians could draw upon reinforcements from off-world, but every rebel who fell was irreplaceable. Medics ran low on supplies to tend the wounded. Food stocks dwindled. The exhausted fighters snatched what little sleep they could. Knowing each day could be their last, they were bleeding out, slowly but surely. Crouched in a camouflaged dugout, Tyler studied a flickering hollow map of the planet, jaw-clenched. The Prylorian lines were tightening around the rebel holdouts, and their noose would soon strangle the resistance for good. They needed a miracle, a game-changer. His eyes fell on a pulsing dot, a Prylorian military spaceport, the enemy's primary transit hub to and from the planet. If the humans could take it, Tyler summoned his top lieutenants and laid out a plan as desperate as it was audacious. It was a roll of the dice, but they were dead anyway if they didn't act. 
One way or another, we're ending this, Tyler said, steel in his voice. Go big or go home, yeah? They slipped through the Prelorian's perimeter in small teams, moving by night, communicating only through tight-beamed bursts. Rebel hackers, armed with code-breaking algorithms and system backdoors, focused on the spaceport's defense grid. When the appointed time came, they struck, hijacking control of sentry guns and scanner arrays. Confusion reigned as the Prylorians suddenly found themselves under fiery from their own turrets. In the chaos, Tyler and his breach team blasted through the walls of the command center. Room by room, corridor by corridor, they battled the defenders, trading shots and grenades at point-blank range. Consoles exploded in showers of sparks, bodies crumpled on blood-slick floors. Tyler caught a pulse bolt to the shoulder but fought on, teeth gritted against the pain. At last the command centre was theirs. The hackers opened the hangar bay doors and disabled the tractor beam projectors. Rebel ships swooped in to land, cargo bays yawning open. Thousands of waiting humans poured aboard, clutching ragged bundles, those too young or old to fight, the families of soldiers, the wounded. Among them were the Resistance's most brilliant minds, scientists and engineers, who had toiled for years to reverse-engineer Prylorian technology in hidden labs. With the facilities on the moon, we'll be able to complete our work, one white-haired physicist said, clasping Tyler's hand. Give us the tools and we'll crack their secrets wide open. Invisibility cloaks, plasma cannons, the lost art of coffee-making. We'll have it all. Tyler clasped the man's shoulder, a fierce grin on his soot-streaked face. Looking forward to it, Doc, give him hell for us. He watched the ships lift off one by one, blue jets flaring. Each was packed to the bulkheads with precious cargo, rising up and up until they punched through the clouds, leaving trails of vapor hanging in the sky. On the moon, a fortified bunker complex waited, hollowed out of the rock, shielded and sealed against the airless surface. There, the evacuees would be safe, the scientists free to build the weapons that would shift the balance of the war. But someone had to stay behind and keep the Prylorians from blasting those ships into oblivion. Tyler and his strike team took up positions in the hangar bay, hunkered down behind hastily welded barricades and cargo crates. They had scrounged every gun they could find, stripped the command center's armory bare, but they all knew they were dead men walking. They just had to hold out long enough for the last transport to get clear. The Prylorians came in a black tide, hundreds of them, chrome armor gleaming under the harsh lights. Plasma bolts hissed and popped, chewing through metal and flesh alike. Tyler's soldiers fought like demons, pouring fire into the enemy ranks, hurling back grenades, dragging the wounded into cover. One by one they fell, the life fading from their eyes, fingers going slack on triggers but they sold their lives at a steep cost. Tyler was the last man standing, a rebel officer's exosuit encasing his body, salvaged rotary cannon blazing in his hands. He waded into the Prylorian formations like a one-man army, servos whining as he swung his weapon in sweeping arcs, painting the deck with ichor and shattered armor. Warning indicators screamed in his helmet, armor integrity dropping with each hit, but he pushed forward roaring his defiance over the external speakers. "'Suck plasma, you scaly bastards!' Tyler bellowed, hosing a squad of Prylorian elites, their bodies coming apart under the onslaught. "'Humanity will never kneel!' As the last transport lifted off with a thunder of jets, Tyler keyed his calm. "'Packages away, repeat, packages away, hit it!' The transport's thrusters flared, igniting the fuel depots stacked along the hangar's sides. A titanic fireball erupted, a searing wave of light and heat that consumed everything in its path. Tyler felt the temperature spike inside his suit an instant before it breached, and then there was only the roar of the flames. In the fortified depths of the rebel bunker complex on the moon, the resistance scientists worked with a desperate intensity. They had toiled for years in secret, risking everything to unravel the secrets of Prylorian technology. Now, with the survival of their people hanging in the balance, they raced to complete their greatest creation. Dr. Ivanov, the chief engineer, stood before a gathered crowd of rebels, his lined face etched with exhaustion,
but eyes bright with fierce pride. My friends, our labors have not been in vain. Behold, the instrument of our liberation. With a dramatic flourish, he activated the hangar bay doors. They ground open ponderously, revealing a cavernous chamber bathed in floodlights. Gasps echoed as the assembled humans beheld rank upon rank of sleek, angular fighters, their matte black hulls seeming to drink in the light. Stealth fighters, Dr. Ivanov proclaimed, equipped with miniaturized fusion drives and plasma cannons of our own design, refined from Prylorian technology, they can outrun and outfight anything the Empire can throw at us. Awed murmurs rippled through the crowd. For the first time in a generation they dared to hope. Captain Soren, now commander of the Resistance forces, stepped forward, his bearing proud and resolute. We have received word that a massive Prylorian fleet is heading for our homeworld, determined to crush us once and for all. But with these ships, we have a chance to strike a blow they will never forget. He activated a hollow display, showing a star map with a blinking red icon. That is the Prylorian throne world, the heart of their empire, and this, the image zoomed in on a sprawling complex of orbital structures, is their central shipyard and command hub. If we can destroy it, we will cripple their military-industrial complex and show the galaxy that the Prylorians are not invincible. Soren's words electrified the rebels. They knew the odds, knew that many of them would not return, but they also knew that this was a chance to strike a blow for freedom that would echo across the stars. As the stealth fighters launched, slipping out into the void like shadows, Soren stood on the command deck watching them go. He thought of Tyler and all the others who had given their lives to bring them to this moment. We will make your sacrifice worth it, he whispered. Humanity will be free. Using stolen clearance codes and signal scramblers, the rebel fleet made the jump to the Prylorian throne world, emerging from hyperspace in the heart of the enemy stronghold. For a breathless moment, they waited to see if their infiltration had been detected. But the Prylorian ships and stations hung silently in space, unaware of the danger that had appeared in their midst. All fighters commence attack, Soren barked. As one, the stealth fighters powered up their weapons and accelerated towards the orbital shipyards, they opened fire in a coordinated barrage, lances of incandescent plasma stabbing out at the unshielded Prylorian warships. Hulls buckled and ruptured under the onslaught, atmosphere and debris spewing into the void. Galarms blared across the Prylorian command net as the shipyard defences stirred to life. But the humans had achieved total surprise, and dozens of ships were crippled or destroyed before they could even power up their shields. The Prylorian defense fleet rallied swiftly, dreadnoughts and cruisers moving to engage the rebel fighters. Soren gripped the command console as he watched the tactical display, the two forces intermixing like a swarm of angry insects. The Prylorian ships unleashed blistering volleys of laser fire and missiles, their heavier weapons ponderously tracking the elusive human craft. The rebel stealth fighters darted and wove through the storm of fire, their advanced jammers and countermeasures Confusing the Prelorian targeting systems, they struck like lightning, appearing out of nowhere to hammer the enemy ships with surgical precision, then vanishing again before the Prelorians could retaliate. But for all their skill and courage, the rebels knew they were hopelessly outnumbered. They could not hope to win a sustained engagement against the might of the Prelorian war machine. Soren's eyes locked on the vast space station at the heart of the shipyards a monstrous construct bristling with weapons and sensor arrays. That was their true target, the nexus of the entire Prylorian military-industrial complex. Red Wing on me, Soren called, peeling his fighter away from the melee. A dozen ships fell in behind him, forming a wedge as they raced towards the central station. Prylorian point defense batteries erupted in a hail of flak and tracer fire, stitching deadly lines across space. Two rebel fighters vanished in blooms of flame, but the rest bored in relentlessly. Proximity alarms howled as they neared the station's hull, its immense bulk filling their viewscreens. Soren gritted his teeth, fighting to hold his course steady. The station's reactor core was deep in the heart of the structure, shielded by dozens of meters of reinforced armor. They would have to punch through. 
Lock torpedoes on the core and prepare to detonate remotely, Soren ordered, his voice flat and cold. We won't get a second shot at this. As the fighters closed to point-blank range, they launched a volley of torpedoes, the projectiles boring into the station's hull like armor-piercing daggers. Then, as one, they slammed their ships into the breach, metal crumpling and tearing like foil. The Prylorian fleet, realizing the humans' intent, surged forward desperately, weapons blazing. But it was too late. With a final defiant cry, Soren triggered the torpedo's detonation as his ship impacted the reactor core. For a heartbeat, there was a blinding flash, a star being born in the heart of the enemy stronghold. Then the station vanished in an apocalyptic fireball, a miniature sun erupting in the void. The blast ripped through the orbiting shipyards like a tidal wave, shattering warships and engulfing orbital foundries. The conflagration was visible from the surface of the throne world, a second sun flaring in the sky. In one fell swoop, a significant portion of the Prylorian war machine had been reduced to molten slag. Aboard the surviving rebel ships, the humans let out ragged cheers, even as they wept for the friends who had given their lives to strike this blow. They knew their homeworld would face terrible retribution, but the Prylorian aura of invincibility had been shattered beyond repair. As the rebel ships scattered to prearranged rally points across the galaxy, they spread the word of what had been done. And as the Prylorian warships turned their guns on the human homeworld, bombarding it to molten glass, the seeds of rebellion were already spreading. Across a thousand worlds, enslaved races looked to the heavens with newfound hope and whispered that the Empire would fall. Humanity would be the spark that lit the inferno. The war was only beginning. The destruction of the Prylorian shipyards sent shockwaves rippling across the galaxy. On a hundred worlds, the downtrodden and enslaved saw the unthinkable become reality. The Prylorian Empire was not invincible. Whispers of rebellion turned to shouts, then to blaster fire as long-suppressed anger boiled over into open insurrection. But the Empire's retaliation was as swift as it was merciless. Prylorian warships descended on rebel-held worlds like avenging angels, leveling cities and slaughtering civilians by the millions. The Kraith, a reptilian race who had been among the first to rise up, were hunted to extinction, their homeworld reduced to a radioactive cinder. The Vek, the Haranu, the Zalati, one by one, species who had dared to defy Prylorian rule, were systematically exterminated, their cultures and histories erased from existence. The human rebels, once so proud and defiant, found themselves scattered and alone, cut off from allies and support. They retreated to hidden bases on remote moons and in asteroid fields, striking out in hit-and-run raids against Prylorian supply lines and outposts. But it was a losing battle. The Empire's counterinsurgency forces, led by the dreaded Inquisitors, were relentless and methodical, rooting out rebel cells and destroying them without mercy. Dr. Ivanov, the brilliant scientist who had engineered the rebels' advanced weaponry, was captured in a daring Prylorian raid on a hidden research facility. In a live broadcast to the entire galaxy, he was paraded before a jeering Prylorian crowd, then publicly flayed alive, his agonized screams echoing across a thousand worlds. As his mutilated corpse was displayed on a pike, the Prylorian Emperor delivered a chilling message. Let this be a lesson to all who would challenge the might of the Empire. There is no hope, there is no escape, there is only the will of Prylorian, now and forever. The Empire's propaganda machine seized on Ivanov's execution, painting the rebels as depraved terrorists who would stop at nothing to destroy the peace and stability of the Prylorian order. Across the galaxy, public opinion began to turn against the rebels. Species who had once cheered their daring exploits now cursed their names, desperate to avoid the Empire's wrath. The rebels found themselves shunned and hunted, with nowhere to turn. In a last desperate attempt to salvage their cause, the remaining human resistance cells came together for a final all-out assault on the heart of Prylorian power, the Emperor's palace on the throne world. Using a captured Prylorian warship, they managed to slip past the planet's formidable defences, landing a strike team in the palace grounds, in bloody, brutal combat, 
they fought their way into the palace itself, determined to cut off the head of the Prylorian regime. But as they battled through the final defences and breached the massive doors of the throne room, they realised they had walked into a trap. The Emperor sat waiting for them, a cruel smile playing across his reptilian features. With a gesture, he activated a hidden device, a psionic amplifier that took his already formidable mental powers and magnified them a hundredfold. The rebel soldiers didn't even have time to scream. One moment they were charging forward, weapons raised, the next they were crumpling to the ground, blood pouring from their eyes, ears and noses as the Emperor's psychic attack liquefied their brains inside their skulls. In a matter of seconds, the entire strike team was reduced to a collection of twitching, drooling husks. But the Emperor wasn't finished. With another cruel smile, he turned his amplified powers outward, casting his mind across the stars. On a hundred worlds, rebel fighters and sympathizers suddenly clutched their heads and collapsed, their minds shattered by the Emperor's psychic assault. In a single instant, the last embers of resistance were snuffed out, extinguished like candles in a hurricane. In the aftermath, the Prylorian Empire tightened its grip on the galaxy as never before. The Emperor decreed that any species that had harbored rebel sympathies was to be placed under permanent martial law, their freedoms and rights permanently revoked. Prylorian troops and inquisitors became a common sight on a thousand worlds, watching for any hint of dissent or defiance. There would be no more rebellions. The Empire would make sure of that. As for the humans, the few broken survivors retreated to the shadows, reduced to scavenging and thievery on the fringes of the galaxy. Where once they had been proud rebels, fighting for freedom and justice, now they were just another race of beaten-down vagabonds, barely clinging to survival. The dream of overthrowing Prylorian rule was well and truly dead, shattered like glass against the cold, hard reality of the Empire's power. In the grand sweep of galactic history, the human rebellion would be remembered as nothing more than a brief spark of defiance, quickly and utterly extinguished by the might of Prylorian. The Empire endured, as it always had and always would, its power unchallenged and unchallengeable. And on a thousand worlds the slaves and the downtrodden looked up at the stars and despaired, knowing that their one chance at freedom had come and gone, and that now there was truly no hope. Only the cold, eternal rule of the Prylorian Empire, stretching on into infinity. The Emperor's psychic assault ripped through the minds of the rebel strike team, shattering their thoughts like glass. One by one they crumpled to the polished floor of the throne room, blood leaking from their eyes and ears. The Emperor allowed himself a moment of satisfaction, savouring the sight of his broken foes. But amidst the carnage a few rebels stirred. Arya, daughter of the legendary Tyler, blinked away the blood and forced herself to her feet. Her father's tactical genius and her mother's iron will coursed through her veins, a quirk of genetics that had spared her from the worst of the psychic onslaught. She staggered to the others who had survived. A grizzled veteran bearing the scars of a hundred battles, a young hacker barely out of his teens, a battle-hardened medic who had patched up countless wounded comrades. They were a ragged band, but in their eyes burned the indomitable spirit of humanity. We need to go, Arya said, her voice raw but steady. We can't win here, not now, but as long as we live, the resistance lives. They fled into the bowels of the palace, using the knowledge gleaned from years of painstaking espionage to navigate the labyrinthine corridors. They emerged into the chaos of a city in turmoil, rebel ships trading fire with Prylorian forces in the skies above. Arya led her small group to a nondescript shuttlecraft hidden in the depths of the city. As they blasted into orbit, she took one last look at the planet that had been the heart of the Empire, now engulfed in the flames of war. We'll be back, she whispered, a promise and a vow. They ran to the edges of the known galaxy, to the forgotten places where the Empire's grip was weakest. On desolate moons and in the depths of uncharted nebulae, they began to rebuild. Arya reached out to other rebel survivors, to the downtrodden and the desperate, forging alliances and gathering strength. It was slow, painful work. The Empire was vast and its reach was long. 
but Arya was patient and clever, striking from the shadows and fading away before the Prylorians could respond. She became a legend, a whisper of hope in the darkness of oppression. Have you heard of Arya? Slaves would murmur to each other in the depths of Prylorian mines and factories. They say she survived the Emperor himself. They say she's building a new rebellion, one that will finish what Tyler started. The Prylorians hunted her relentlessly, but they were chasing a ghost. Arya was always one step ahead, guided by the cunning she had inherited from her father and the indomitable will she had learned from her mother. Years turned into decades, decades into centuries. The story of the human rebellion faded into myth and legend, a half-forgotten tale whispered in the dark. But in secret, the resistance endured, passed from parent to child, from teacher to student. Arya grew old, her once black hair turning silver, and her face lined with the passage of years. But her eyes never lost their fire, and her spirit never wavered. She watched and waited, biding her time, until the moment was right. And then, a thousand years after the fall of the First Rebellion, the Empire began to crack, stretched thin by the constant need to suppress dissent, rotted from within by corruption and decadence, it was a colossus with feet of clay. Arya saw her chance. She sent word through the secret networks she had spent centuries building, and the resistance rose as one. On a hundred worlds, rebel cells struck at Prylorian installations, led by Arya's own descendants, her great-great-grandchildren, inheritors of her legacy of defiance. The aging emperor, his once terrifying psychic powers dimmed by the passage of time, could not stop them all. The Prylorians fought back with all the ferocity of a cornered beast, and the galaxy burned. Worlds were reduced to cinders, and the death toll mounted into the billions. But this time, the rebels did not fight alone. Inspired by the humans' courage, other slave races rose up to join the fight. Even some Prylorian factions, disgusted by the excesses of the Empire, turned against their own kind. The war ground on for years, a bloody stalemate that threatened to engulf the entire galaxy. But slowly, painfully, the tide began to turn. The rebels chipped away at the Empire's strength, liberating world after world. In the final battle, on the steps of the Imperial Palace where it had all begun, Arya's descendant stood face to face with the Emperor himself. The old tyrant snarled, lashing out with the last of his psychic might. But the rebel leader, bearing the strength of generations of resistance, weathered the assault and struck back, plunging her blade into the Emperor's black heart. And so, with a whimper rather than a bang, the Prylorian Empire fell. But there was no joy in the victory, no celebrations in the streets. The cost had been too high, the wounds too deep. The Empire shattered into a thousand bickering states, each claiming a piece of the bloody pie. The galaxy slid into a new dark age, as the stability of oppression gave way to the chaos of newfound freedom. Warlords and petty tyrants rose and fell, and the common people suffered, as they always had. As for the humans, the race that had started it all, they faded into the background, their role in the great drama finished. Arya's descendants vanished into the mists of history, becoming legends whispered around campfires and starship helms. In the end, there were no true winners, only survivors left to pick through the ashes of a shattered galaxy. The cycle of oppression and rebellion, it seemed, was doomed to repeat, an Ouroboros eating its own tail. But in the heart of every slave, every downtrodden soul, the spark of resistance still smouldered. The spirit of Tyler, of Arya, of all those who had fought and died for freedom, could never be truly extinguished. And in that, perhaps, there was a glimmer of hope, the hope that one day the wheel might be broken and a new age might dawn. But that was a tale for another time, another generation, for now the galaxy licked its wounds and looked to the stars, wondering what new shape their endless story would take. The shattered remnants of the galaxy drifted in the void, a thousand disparate worlds struggling to find their way in the wake of the Prylorian Empire's collapse. On the fringes of known space, a battered ship limped through the darkness, its hull scored by the scars of countless battles. 
Within its walls, a ragtag band of survivors huddled together, clinging to each other in the face of an uncertain future. Jax, a grizzled veteran of the human resistance, stood at the helm, his eyes haunted by the ghosts of the fallen. He had fought alongside Arya in the final days of the rebellion, had seen the fire in her eyes as she rallied her people for one last desperate stand. Now, with Arya gone and the resistance scattered to the winds, he felt the weight of leadership settling heavily on his shoulders. "'What's our status, Zara?' he asked, his voice rough with exhaustion. The young woman at the navigation console looked up, her face pale in the flickering light of the displays. "'We're running low on fuel and supplies, Jax. We need to find a port soon, somewhere we can resupply and make repairs.' Jax nodded grimly. The ship had taken a beating in their last encounter with a Prylorian patrol, and they were in no shape for another fight. Set a course for the Elysium system. It's a long shot, but there were rumors of a rebel base there back in the day. As Zara input the coordinates, Jax's thoughts turned to the challenges ahead. The fall of the Prylorian Empire had left a power vacuum in the galaxy, and already new factions were rising to fill the void. Some, like the remnants of the human resistance, sought to build a better future from the ashes of the old, Others, like the warlords and petty tyrants that had sprung up in the Empire's wake, saw only an opportunity for personal gain. And then there were the Nezrin. Whispers had reached Jax's ears of a new power rising in the shadows, a race of cybernetic zealots who sought to impose their vision of perfect order on the chaos of the galaxy. Led by a figure known only as the Prophet, they swept across the stars like a plague, assimilating all in their path into their collective consciousness. Jax had seen the aftermath of a Nezrin attack once, had witnessed the horror of entire populations stripped of their individuality, their minds subsumed into the unthinking obedience of the hive. The memory still haunted his dreams, the sight of blank, soulless ease staring out from faces that had once held laughter and love. He knew that the human resistance battle-weary and scarred as they were, might be the only force left in the galaxy capable of standing against the Nezrin threat. But how could they hope to prevail against an enemy that could turn their own against them, that could replenish its numbers with every conquest? As if in answer to his thoughts, the ship's comm system crackled to life and a familiar voice filled the air. This is Admiral Nara of the Galactic Alliance. All ships stand by for urgent transmission. Jax leaned forward, his heart pounding in his chest. The Galactic Alliance was a loose coalition of worlds that had banded together in the wake of the Prylorian Empire's fall, seeking strength in unity. If they were reaching out now, it could only mean one thing. This is a call to arms, Admiral Nara's voice continued, her tone grim. The Nezrin have launched a major offensive, and their forces are sweeping across the Outer Rim, Worlds are falling by the dozen, their populations assimilated into the Nezrin hive mind. We need every ship, every soldier, every ally we can muster to stand against this threat. Jax looked around the bridge, saw the fear and determination warring in the eyes of his crew. They had all lost so much, had fought so hard for the chance at a better future. Could they really be asked to put it all on the line again, to brave the nightmares of another war? But in the end there was no choice. The Nezrin would not stop, would not rest until every last vestige of free will was crushed beneath their metal heels, and the human resistance, for all their scars and all their weariness, were still the guardians of that flame, the protectors of that most precious of things, the right to choose one's own path. Set a course for the rendezvous point, Jack said, his voice steady with resolve. It's time to finish what we started. As the ship leaped forward into the void, Jax felt a strange sense of calm settle over him. They were battered and bruised, a mere shadow of the force they had once been. But they were still human, still fighting for the dream that Arya and so many others had died for. And in the face of that, even the cold metal of the Nezrin could not prevail forever. In the battles that followed, the human resistance fought with a ferocity born of desperation, Jax led his crew into the heart of the fray, their battered ship darting and weaving through the Nezrin lines, striking at the enemy with every weapon at their disposal. They watched in horror, 
as entire worlds fell before the Nezrin advance, their populations absorbed into the hive mind in a nightmarish fusion of flesh and metal. The Resistance's victories were bought with blood and sacrifice. Each soldier, each ship, laid down their lives in a desperate bid to stem the tide. But no matter how many Nezrin ships they destroyed, no matter how many cybernetic soldiers they put down, more always rose to take their place. The hive mind was relentless, inexhaustible, replenishing its numbers with each conquest. Slowly, inevitably, the resistance was pushed back, their allies falling away one by one as the Nezrin's victory seemed assured. Jax and his crew found themselves part of a dwindling fleet, hunted and harried across the stars, always one step ahead of the enemy, but never far enough. In the end they came to a remote, fortified world, a place where the remnants of the resistance could make their last stand. As the Nezrin forces closed in, the planet became a hive of desperate activity, every resource, every scrap of knowledge bent towards a single, desperate goal. It's a virus, Zara explained, her eyes alight with a feverish intensity. A combination of biological and technological components designed to attack the Nezrin hive mind. If we can get it into their network, it could sever the connections, free the assimilated populations. Jax looked at the schematics, his brow furrowed. It was a desperate plan, a last throw of the dice, but what choice did they have? As the Nezrin forces began their final assault, the resistance met them head-on, throwing every ship, every soldier into the fray. Jax and his crew fought like demons, buying time with each blast of their weapons, each desperate maneuver. In the planet's command center, Zara and the other scientists worked feverishly, racing against the clock to complete the virus. And then, with a final triumphant shout, it was done. But there was no time for celebration. The Nezrin were at the gates, their victory all but assured. In a final desperate act, the last of the defenders loaded the virus into their ships, into their own bodies, and hurled themselves at the enemy in a suicide charge. Jax watched from the command center as the resistance ships slammed into the Nezrin lines as the virus began to spread like wildfire through the hive mind. For a moment, it seemed as if the galaxy itself held its breath. And then the Nezrin screamed. Across the galaxy, on a hundred assimilated worlds, the hive mind shattered, the prophet's control broken at last. Populations writhed in agony as the virus tore through their minds, severing the neural links that had bound them. Some freed from the hive mind's thrall staggered to their feet, blinking in the sudden light of individuality. But many more lay still, their minds shattered by the abrupt severance, their bodies nothing more than empty shells. In the end, the Nezrin Empire collapsed, its worlds and peoples left reeling in the aftermath of the virus's devastation. And on that remote, war-torn planet, the last of the human resistance looked out upon the fruits of their victory and wept. They had won, but the cost had been too high, the sacrifices too great. In the silence that followed, each survivor took a long, shuddering breath and then turned their eyes to the stars. The future was theirs now, for better or for worse. The legacy of the human rebellion, the scars of the long struggle, would shape the galaxy for generations to come. But for now, in this moment, they were simply survivors, each seeking their own path in a universe forever changed. Some would strive to rebuild what had been lost, to recapture the dream that had driven them for so long. Others would strike out into the unknown, forging new destinies from the ashes of the old. But all would carry with them the memory of those who had fallen, the weight of the choices they had made. In the end, the story of the human rebellion would pass into legend, a tale of sacrifice and courage, of the indomitable will of a species that had refused to bend the knee. And in that story, perhaps, there was a lesson for the ages, a reminder of the eternal struggle between the forces of oppression and the unquenchable fire of the free spirit. The galaxy would spin on, empires would rise and fall, but that fire, once kindled, could never be fully extinguished, and in the hearts of the survivors, the embers of hope and defiance would smolder, ready to blaze forth anew whenever the call came. 
For such was the nature of the human spirit, unbroken and unbowed, a light in the darkness that would endure as long as there were those willing to carry the flame. The galaxy spun on, a mere husk of what it once was. The Nezrin's defeat left only ruin in its wake. The great empires of old crumbled, their power scattered to the cosmic winds. In their place, a hundred petty factions scrabbled for control, each claiming to be the rightful heir to the shattered thrones. Amidst this chaos, a new force emerged. They called themselves the Venhari, and they came from beyond the galaxy's edge. Their ships were sleek and silver, their technology advanced beyond even the Prylorians at their height. And they came bearing gifts. To the war-ravaged worlds, the Venhari offered succor. Food for the starving, medicine for the sick, the knowledge to rebuild what had been lost. Many embraced them as saviors, weeping with gratitude as the Venhari's silver ships descended from the skies. But not all were convinced. Among the skeptics was Zara, a young human with fire in her eyes and rebellion in her blood. She was a scion of the old resistance, raised on tales of her ancestors' sacrifices, and something about the Venhari didn't sit right with her. No one gives something for nothing, she said to anyone who would listen. What do they want in return? Her questions were met with scorn, even anger. In a galaxy so desperate for hope, few wanted to hear doubts, but Zara could not shake the feeling that beneath the Venhari's benevolent mask, something darker lurked. As the Venhari's influence spread, Zara set out to find the truth. She tracked down old resistance contacts, dug through abandoned data caches. Each new discovery only deepened her fears. On a remote outpost at the galaxy's fringe, she finally found her answer. A defector, a Venhari who had turned against his own kind, shared a tale of horror. The Venhari were not saviors, but parasites, their gifts were a means to make worlds dependent, to drain them dry. They were the vanguard of an extra-galactic swarm, softening up new feeding grounds for their masters. Zara raced back to the galactic core, desperate to warn of the coming doom. But she found a galaxy already in thrall to the Venhari. Her warnings were dismissed as paranoid delusions. Even those who had once fought beside her now turned their backs, content in their complacency. Undeterred, Zara gathered a small band of believers. If the galaxy would not listen, they would make it see. They struck at Venhari outposts, sabotaged their ships, did everything they could to expose the truth. But it wasn't enough. The Venhari branded them terrorists, turned the galaxy against them. Zara and her companions became hunted fugitives, always one step ahead of the Venhari's pursuers. In desperation, Zara hatched a final plan. The Venhari's power was centered on a massive artificial world at the galaxy's edge. If they could destroy it, perhaps they could break the Venhari's hold, give the galaxy a chance to fight back. It was a suicide mission. They all knew it. But they went anyway, sneaking aboard the great station, fighting their way to its heart. And there, Zara learned the final horrifying truth. The Venhari were not the true threat. They were merely servants, thralls of something far older and far hungrier, an ancient intelligence that had devoured countless galaxies, that saw their galaxy as just another morsel to be consumed. In that moment, Zara made her choice. With a final defiant cry, she plunged her ship into the station's core. The explosion tore through the Venhari's stronghold, destroying it utterly. But Zara and her brave companions were lost, consumed in the cataclysmic blast. In the aftermath, the galaxy slowly awakened to the truth. The Venhari's lies were exposed, their influence crumbled, but the damage was done. The galaxy was a shattered remnant, its people scarred by the wounds of endless war. And in the void between the stars, the ancient hunger stirred, its appetite whetted by the Venhari's failure. The human rebels, once the galaxy's brightest hope, faded into memory. Their sacrifices, their bravery, were forgotten by all save a few. The galaxy spun on, caught between the ghosts of its past and the looming spectre of its future. But even in the darkest of times, there are those who remember, those who carry the spark of defiance, who refuse to let the light be extinguished. 
In their hearts, the spirit of the rebellion lives on, a flicker of hope in an uncaring universe. And so the galaxy holds its breath, waiting for the next chapter in its endless story, waiting for the next hero to rise, to take up the fight once more. For in the end, it is not the great powers that shape the cosmos, but the countless acts of bravery and sacrifice, the refusal to submit to the darkness. The battle is far from over. The ancient hunger still lurks in the void, biding its time. The scars of the past still ache. The wounds of war still bleed. But as long as even one soul remains defiant, as long as the spark of rebellion still smoulders, there is hope, not for victory, perhaps, but for the chance to fight another day. In a galaxy defined by darkness, that glimmer of light is the most precious thing of all. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.